Hello and welcome to another Solana tutorial. Today's finally the day where we're gonna talk about Anchor. I'm gonna give you an introduction to Anchor because here at the Solana development course, we reach the point where we can do module five Anchor program development. And we're gonna start with an introduction to Anchor. In short, Anchor is just a framework that builds on top of the Solana Rust that we already know, so the Solana program stuff, and it helps us do some stuff more easily, like all the owner checks and some security validations and some derivations. Anchor abstracts those away to make it easier to build on Solana. Now, I say easier, if you already know native Rust Solana, then it takes a little bit of time to get used to Anchor, but Anchor automates a lot of stuff that you always had to do manually. So in the long run, it makes sense to also learn Anchor. If you haven't yet started learning programming Solana programs, then Anchor could actually be a good place to start because you don't have to deal with a lot of the deserialization, serialization stuff because Anchor just does that automatically. And I'm still myself not sure if I prefer native Rust or Anchor. Both has its advantages and disadvantages. For me personally, Anchor is a bit tougher to maintain, like in terms of the libraries, because yes, it is easier to program in Anchor, but then also if something doesn't work, then it's harder to fix it than it is in native Rust. At least that's my personal experience. But I want you to make your own experiences, so that's why we're gonna talk about Anchor today. Today we're gonna learn how to use the Anchor framework to build a basic program. We're gonna describe the basic structure of an Anchor program and we're gonna explain how to implement basic account validation and security checks. Yes, because that's what Anchor helps us with a lot. The TLDR of today's lesson. Anchor is a framework for building Solana programs. Yes, I think we established that, cool. Anchor macros uh, speed up the process of building Solana programs by abstracting away a significant amount of boilerplate code. Yes, so all those things that we constantly need to do, the serialization, deserialization, decoding accounts, those kind of things just Anchor automates them like account checks, owner checks. Anchor allows you to build secure programs more easily. Yes, because it does a lot of the security checks itself, because it also just compiles down to the native Rust, which then also just compiles down to the BPF or now SPF bytecode. And it's also providing a simple way to implement additional checks. Yeah, they have like those constraints and stuff, which actually in the beginning are hard to understand, but that's why we have those lessons. And otherwise we just go through Anchor documentation. Don't you worry, I got gotcha. So, overview, what the hell is Anchor? It's a development framework, easier, faster, more secure, all the good things. It's the go-to framework for Solana development for a good reason. Yes, so most of the Solana programs are now written in Anchor. That's maybe also an interesting thing to mention. Makes it easier to organize, reason about, organize and reason about your code, implement common security checks automatically and abstracts away a significant amount of boilerplate. Yes, so Anchor, if you just Google Anchor, you will not find the thing that you're looking for, so better put Solana there as well. We have Anchor Lang, the introduction, we have the Anchor Book, which is a, a great place to go, and then Coral has the actual source code. So that is the Anchor source code in case you wanted to find that. We'll also put those resources in the description below. The Anchor Book, definitely a go-to place to get started. The Anchor program structure. Anchor has macros and traits that generate such boilerplate Rust code for us. Boilerplate code, by the way, is a term for code that appears the same way several times. Like it's always the same code. So we can just hide that behind a macro. So here are some of the main ones. Declare ID, that's a macro that declares the program's on-chain address. In a native Solana Rust program, we don't have to do that. The program ID then just is whatever the account it lives on, but Anchor wants to know where it lives so it can make all of those owner checks and say, oh, I just accept this account if I own it. So we want to declare our program ID within Anchor. Then program, that's where all the instruction logic goes. So Anchor abstracts away the entry point 
and provides you instructions. You can just write the functions in there and then Anchor will automatically, you know, map those instructions based on instruction data. And I think the first eight bytes are reserved for instruction data, if I remember correctly. Accounts, that's a trait applied to structs representing a list of accounts required for an instruction, meaning we can basically build a struct that defines which accounts we expect. Because in earlier lessons, let's see, at, for instance, there, we always had to do like next account info, next account info, next account info, and then essentially check on those that it's actually the accounts we expect. And we have to do all of those checks manually. It would be much nicer if we predefine what we expect. And then anchor does all the checks for us. And that's what's happening. So we can use this accounts trait and then the account as an attribute will define what the one specific account actually requires. But let's have a look at that in detail. And I think I want to just get started and, and get the code out because then we can have a look at that in here as well. I'm not going to go through the installation stuff. I'm just going to assume that you have anchor installed. That's somewhat easily Googleable, and it should probably also be in here somewhere their installation. There you go. That's the just follow those instructions. And then you should have anchor CLI available. We're currently in version 0 0.26. That's what I use as reference, because stuff changes and it might not stay the same. We've got anchor. And what we can do now is we say anchor in it, which creates us a new project. And then we give it the project name first anchor program. Yeah, just gonna name it like that. Why not? I'm not trying to be creative. Then it downloads all of the dependencies, which usually takes a while. Then we have that folder first anchor program and we can check out our stuff here or look at it here in the list. We can see it created this anchor toml, the cargo, which is an automatically created file, a package JSON and front end stuff goes in here. Node modules, you know what that is. And the program will be in programs slash project name. And in here we have the source, a librs, which holds our program. So let's look at this librs. If we don't do anything else, then that's what it comes with. If that address looks familiar, it's because every goddamn anchor program that you initialize just has this address declared. Don't ask me where that points to. Where does it point to? Is anything there? Nothing there actually on mainnet at least. So anyway, we will need to replace that anyway with our program ID. So that's the program file. And then we have the anchor toml, but we're going to probably have a look at that later. So let's stay with that. Declare ID we said is the thing where we define which program address we have. So the program ID and in anchor, where do we find the program ID? When we build it, it will create us a key file. But let's see what James says to specify the on chain address. When you build a program for the first time, the framework will generate a new key pair. Yes, that, that's what I was just talking about. This becomes a default key pair used to deploy the program, unless specified otherwise, the corresponding public key should be used as the program ID specified in declare ID macro. Yes. So if I were to just go here and tell anchor to build me this thing with anchor build, which will then take a while because it's going to download all the dependencies and install them and compile them. And so we're gonna let that run in the background while we discuss the next thing, which is the program macro. So as you can already see here, program, that's, that's where we can put our individual instructions and all the public functions inside this module will be treated as individual instructions for our program. So in this case, we have one instruction called initialize. And if we wanted to create a new instruction, we could do so simply by creating a new function like this. And then we might also want to change that, but we'll get to that. Each of those instructions requires one parameter of type context and can include function parameters representing the instruction data. That's the next cool thing. Anchor automatically does the decoding of instruction data. So the deserialization based on what you put in here as arguments for your function. So for instance, if I put here number of type U64, then Anchor 
will decode those eight bytes from instruction data, so the next eight bytes, and write whatever it has there as our number. And we can also, you know, put anything else there, vector, string, a byte, and that will then automatically be decoded, which is quite sweet, so we don't need to deal with that. That's also why in the beginning it might actually be handy to start with Anchor. I actually started programming with Anchor, and then I went to Native Rust, now I'm coming back to Anchor. So what is this context thing that is the first parameter here though? That holds a bunch of metadata for our instruction. For instance, the accounts and the program ID itself is also once again passed in here in the context. Then we have remaining accounts that actually you can ignore for now because you shouldn't really use that anyway. In some cases it makes sense, but that's just if there are more accounts than we have specified in our list of expected accounts. If one instruction can take an arbitrary number of accounts, that might make sense. But like for most of the cases, you don't wanna use that. And then bump seeds, if we use PDAs, then the bumps automatically come in here as well as a map for address to bump. So you don't have to recalculate them with find program address. Now this context comes as a generic with type T, where we can actually define which accounts we expect. So here we'll have those accounts and which accounts we can define. And then through this context, through this argument, we can then actually access all those fields, of course, with context.accounts, program ID, remaining accounts, etc. etc. So let's have a look at this T. What should be put in there. We can use the accounts trait to define a data structure, data structure of validated accounts. Validated accounts. So Anchor does checks on them. That's the important part. If we define it like this with those accounts, then Anchor makes sure it's actually those accounts that we expect. Otherwise, we get nice errors. And another nice helpful page is Anchor SO errors. It's a nice cheat sheet still installing. Anchor errors cheat sheet. Yes, that's what I want. Because there we will see all of the errors. They will come as a custom program error as we learned in previous lessons where we talked about errors. And then the error code of the custom program error will be those. And for instance, those are the constraints errors and there are the account errors, not mutable, invalid program ID, all those things are being checked by Anchor. And if it doesn't match, then this custom program error is returned and the transaction fails, of course. See, I mean, that could be another disadvantage of Anchor. It just blows up the program a lot. It has a lot of dependencies. And if you just want one quick little program, then that might just be too much to include, which also increases your rent, obviously, an Anchor program that does the same thing or the same thing is more expensive because it needs more space for all that checking stuff. But those are like peanuts, as my dad would say. It's like, make that a deciding factor of whether or not to use Anchor. Those security checks actually are useful. So yeah, might as well keep them in. Okay, move it on. And since we put in this accounts field as the type for the generic of the context, we can then access those accounts inside this context and we don't need to manually deserialize them anymore. You typically apply the account straight through the derive macro, e.g. derive accounts. This implements an accounts deserializer on the given struct and removes the need to deserialize each account manually. Yes, that's why we do that. I'm gonna pretend I know what this means. I don't though. And I'm also too lazy to Google. Point is, we can then just define the accounts we want. It's an introduction. We don't want to get into the very details of all of that yet. Right, so the accounts trait has all those implementations that do the actual checking. And constraints are provided for each field using the account attribute. I'm on that shortly. That will be this then. So in the beginning, you just need to get used to how that's written. You just use the derive accounts with a capital accounts, because that's the trait. And then all of those are account in lowercase letters, because that's the attribute. In this example, we have the instruction one that uses the context of type instruction accounts. And then the instruction accounts here are derived accounts with the following three accounts. And there we can already see one account is a special account of our type. So we say which layout that account should have. One account is a signer and one account is a program 
more specifically, the system program. So Anchor also has predefined types for that. And when this instruction one is invoked, then the program, so the implementation is in this trait, it does all the checks that the account actually matches or the accounts, those actually match what we expect here in this instruction accounts struct. And it also checks any additional constraints specified. We can put more constraints in here, but we'll have a look at that in a second, I think. No, not really in this lesson, but there is yet again a great page in the docs of the accounts, of the derived accounts, implements accounts to serialize a given struct. And, the, and all the constraints you can find here in this list. So there are a bunch of normal constraints. We'll go through a few of them, but then we also have like has one or like constraint here. That's an arbitrary constraint with any expression that needs to evaluate to true. Otherwise an error is returned. And then we have special constraints like from the SPL, like we can check for token mints and stuff. Anyway, that's another thing for you to have a look at. That goes further than the introduction that I want to do today. So yeah, just pointing you in the right direction with all of those things. So after a shit ton of time, this has now compiled and it created us in here in target, it created us the deploy, which contains the program itself, the SO file, we know that from like normal Rust, and then also created us a key pair. So we could now be like Solana address and check what this target deploy first anchor program key pair would have as an address 4kfn and of course we could replace it with whatever if we wanted a specific program address anchor program like that like a pro although that might already be too many letters there we go a pro -v. if i want that to be my program address then i could just move that thing to target, deploy, and then my first anchor program, keep here JSON. Boom. Then if we check again, now this file has this address and then I could put that in here into my declare. And then I would have to do anchor build one more time, of course, because we changed some, something. Anyway, let's remove this initialize and just call it my instruction. Like if we created a, an empty anchor program, it already lists us this, this derived accounts here that we should do that as an example. It makes it easier for you to get started. Anyway, where are we? Account validation. Now inside this derived accounts struct for our initialize, he has a instruction accounts. Let's do it like that, instruction accounts. And inside this instruction accounts here, we can specify the individual hashtag accounts mute for writable, like mutable. So this account is written to, and then we define what kind of account it is. So here we give it a name like the data account, and we say it should be an account of type. And there we could specify our own type, or it could be a token account or something, or a system program. If we say it's a signer, that's nothing else than an account where anchor checks that it's the account info says is signer. So it does a signer check for this one. And as I already mentioned, we can have our own custom account type, which remember in the movie thingy, we defined like one James did with a string or a byte where we say that's the account discriminator. Anchor does the same thing, but it's much nicer to just create a struct of what this account contains. And then we can directly work with that. Anchor provides a number of types that can be used to represent accounts. Each type implements different account validation. That's the full list. Again, the docs we have a signer, we have a program, we can make it boxed so that it's saved on the heap, not on the stack. We have sysvars, system accounts, unchecked accounts, that's basically uh, any account anchor doesn't do a check. That's just if we want a normal account info. And account, there we check for ownership. So if we provide account, then we expect that account to be our account. And we can make op optional accounts. Starting with account. That account wraps the account info and verifies ownership plus deserializes the data into a Rust type. So we can define a struct 
and then the account automatically gets deserialized. How does that work? Well, we provide such a struct here and we have to define it somewhere. James once again shows us the account info and telling us the data is automatically deserialized and the owner is checked that it's the, the program we're calling from. Yes, T is this and then whoever owns this. So it's not always our program, but whoever owns the struct, that the, the type that we put in here. If we define that, then we. That's actually quite nice. That's actually a quite nice system. Yes, yes, yes. So when the type of this account is specified within the same crate, using the account attribute macro, then the program ownership checks against the program ID defined in this declare ID macro. And if that was declared somewhere else in another space, then their declare ID would be used here for the owner. If we have a signer type, then anchor checks that this account signed the transaction, no, no other ownership checks are done. You should only use the signer when the underlying account data is not required in the instruction. Okay, no more words on that, fine. Then program checks that the account is a certain program. For instance, we could check for the system program. Anchor already provides such a type, which includes the program ID of the system program to check against. So then the following checks are made. Is the public key of the expected program? And is that account executable? Because obviously a program needs to be executable. And so all those checks, they are hidden from us. We can see them here now but they are hidden. And if we just, you know, write a line like this, then that happens in the background. So you don't need to worry about that anymore when using Anchor. There is the same link. I think that's that, right? Yep. Cool. So James also has that in his course already. Cool. Because we can define additional constraints. For instance, for this account name here, he uses the constraints init, payer and space. Is that a constraint? Do we call them constraints? And basically all of those things hide away some functionality. For instance, init creates the account with CPI to the system program and initializes it. So that does a create account instruction with the system program and also writes some discriminated data there. Anchor automatically for all of the anchor accounts that we define like this, they use an eight byte discriminator at the very start of the account to make sure that the account is actually what we expect and therefore anchor reserves eight bytes. That's why we have to make it eight plus eight here, given that we were to store like one U64 or something. Payer specifies who pays for this initialization and we can just say payer equals user and anchor then automatically knows that the payer is the user key so the the account address of the signer that we have here so we can use those things up in here that will work so we can cross reference that but yeah we can just say payer equals user then it automatically gives that public key of that account into the system program create account instruction as the payer the fee payer who pays the rent for the account. And then space specifies how much or how many bytes are allocated. And in this case, it's eight plus eight. The first eight bytes is for this discriminator, as already mentioned. And the next eight bytes is the actual data then, which we define in the account struct type, which so far I didn't see yet. Where is it? Oh, here, down here, that account struct is just a U64. So eight bytes. That's why we need eight plus eight here. Then for the user, we specify that this account is mutable, AKA it's written to, or can be written to. And we need to do that because obviously we deduce Lamperts from there because we have it as a payer. So we want to, you know, change the Lamperts. So this account needs to be mutable, it needs to be writable. If I make a normal data account mutable, then Anchor automatically writes the data there after the instruction is done. So we don't need to deserialize and serialize again. Anchor does it automatically as soon as I say, for instance, with this account dot data equals some number, then it actually writes the data onto that account already. But maybe I'm skipping ahead too much. Note that the init constraint placed on the account name automatically includes a mutable constraint. Aha, okay. So that's why we don't need to say mute init because init we can only do that if it's mutable. So that already contains that. Okay, cool. Good to know. So both of them are mutable. The account attribute is applied to structs representing the data structure of a Solana account. 
it implements the following traits. Account serialize, deserialize, anchor serialize, anchor deserialize, clone, discriminator, owner. You can read more about that here. Those things we already know, I guess. And also clone, that's standard Rust trait, creating as a copy. Well, not quite creating as a clone, but you know. Um, the first eight bytes are reserved for a unique account discriminator. Self-described by the first eight bytes of the SHA-65 of the account's Rust ident. Interesting. So now we also know what's written in there. Don't know what a Rust ident is, but that's hashed and then stored. And the deserializations will check for that discriminator and if it doesn't match, then return an error. And that's how we're making sure that it's actually of that type. Because again, the user can put in anything here, but the first eight bytes also need to match. Plus the owner needs to match. So then we can be sure that it's the account we expect. Of the account types names. So just the name. Implements the owner using the program ID by the what? In other words, all accounts initialized using an account type defined in the account attribute within the program are also owned by the program. Okay, so if we're here with this declare ID and here we have the those accounts, those accounts like this, an account struct like this, this account in here is being checked for this program ID. So if I have this account struct, that's here and that's on the same level as this. So this program ID is checked for, for the owner. I think that's how it works. And this account attributes ensures that it can be used as an account in instruction accounts. So because we define this attribute here, we can then use it in this type here. If we have that all together now with this account, where we use this account struct from here, then on initialization, the first eight bytes, this discriminator is written into the data field and the remaining data, so the data field of the account in the instruction, I would say account name dot data, that will then match the actual struct in here. So I could say account name dot data. So it's not the same as this data because that contains the discriminator as well. And then bad example, because you called that data, I can call that whatever, right? I can call this number one, and then I can have another thing like a uh, number two, which is, I don't know, I use 16 for instance, and that will all be written inside this data field of the account. So in the actual account data, but automatically, and I can access it using, in my case, data account dot number one and data account dot number two. So essentially here I define what data I want and then anchor automatically does the serialization and deserialization for me. I just say context. So let's do that. Let's do the example here. It could just be like context accounts, and then I have the accounts. So for instance, also the data account. And then here I could directly access number one and number two, those data fields. And if I were to write something in here, then that would automatically be written into the account data. So no need for me to serialize and deserialize stuff anymore, like manually, as I would have to do in native Rust. Cool. That's that. Where were we? Cool. They bring it all together. All together now. That's how a anchor program looks like. And what it does is it initializes an account and it updates the data field here, account name data to some instruction data in this case. Okay. We can do the same in our program. We can also put a number here, input number, which should then also be a U. 64 and then I can just set it to the input number and that's then automatically stored in there. So that's our simple first program. I would need to also use that paste the user and space in my case would be eight plus eight plus two because I have another number here that I don't really use, but I have it. Let's see if that would compile anchor build because it's giving me red stuff. Damn it. Undeclared lifetime. Yeah, I, I still don't fully get what lifetimes are. So I guess I'm just going to put that in here. You need a lifetime. There you go. Now you have a lifetime. Ah, there we have it. Non-optional init constraint requires non-optional system program. Right. So to do the init, obviously you need to be able to call the system program, but it's cool. like anchor has okay error messages. You just need to find the right one. We do another hashtag account that is not mutable, then apparently we don't need to 
specify that if we don't have any further constraints. So we don't need that. We just say pop system program, which is a program of type. I can have the lifetime and then system. Then that looks better. There we go. See, and that was the error. Like that was that was my that was what I was missing. But the errors were like all like method not found in the da 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 not implemented for. So it's all quite confusing. But if we start with the first error, then in this case, we were able to fix it. But that's like one of the issues I still have with Anchor, since I don't understand everything as well. Most of the times I just can't, like I can't pinpoint what the actual error is. And then I'm just confused and then I just give up and then I'm like, screw Anchor. For such simple programs, that's all easy. That works. Well, the demo goes through what we essentially already did, except for anchor key list. What does that do? Did you mean keys? Yes, I meant keys. First anchor program. <laughs> and then it gives me my... Oh, so that's the quick version of doing what I did earlier with the Solana address and finding the address of this key pair, which, you know, fair enough. Update this. And then we also need to put it in the anchor toml. So we're gonna copy this and put it in the anchor toml here. And then James builds a counter. We can use the same things here. Like the message macro also works in anchor. Pretty much all of what works in native Rust works in anchor. You just need to have the right imports. Data account created. But you know what? Why, why build such a counter if we already have a nice first program like this where we just write some input into some account might as well test this right or is there anything else that james does here that is different he adds another instruction for increment and update and build yeah i mean why not let's build this and execute it that is our basic program now, just a very simple, we write some data into some account and that's it. Let's try and build and deploy this and then test it. You can, if you prefer, build that counter as James does, but it's essentially the same, except that he has a second function for increment. And we will build a second function, but like, so first let's get this thing deployed. We've already done anchor build. Let's do it one more time just to make sure. There we go. Boom. Done. Which gives us in the deploy this anchor SO, which we don't want to open. And then we can just say anchor deploy and it will deploy to whatever I specify here. And I specify local net as the cluster and this as my key pair. Both of them don't exist yet. So might as well start up my Solana test validator, get that running. Meanwhile, create myself a key pair for myself here. So that's the authority, authority. And then I'll just use this thing here because I can, this is gonna be my wallet. And then I say Solana config set also this as my wallet. And then I Solana airdrop myself one, two, three, sol. Because I can, I'm on local net. I can airdrop myself as much as I want. And then I just say anchor deploy, boom, and that will deploy to local net. That's it. It's as easy as that if everything works, which in this simple example, it does. And it tells me program ID is this a pro as we grinded ourselves earlier. And now I can call this program, right? I can now send a transaction. I can manually build that or Anchor also creates those nice IDLs here for us that contains useful metadata for our program, like all the instructions, like here we have the my instruction and see it already automatically kind of JavaScripts that or typed scripts. It changes from snake case as we had it here to camel case as you would expect it in TypeScript. And it also lists which accounts are required here and whether they're writable and signers. So the writable and signer flags as we know them. And then the arguments for this specific instruction. It That's the name and that's the type. And then it also defines the accounts and in the metadata, it has our program address. So that's all very helpful stuff. Using this IDL, we can now easily test our 
program and we don't have to manually build transactions, but we can use this. Yeah, so that's next lesson stuff. But essentially what we wanna do is test it anyway inside our test, which Anchor already neatly provides for us here in this test file that's already automatically set up for us where it you know loads the correct program type so we'll just use this and it has a first test called is initialized where it calls the initialize method and actually we don't have a initialize method anymore but we will use the my instruction and then we can provide the correct data for that. First, it just expects the input number and I never know how that's done. Like oh, every time I forget how that's done. At some point I'm gonna remember this, but like not yet. Just make a big number of 666, new big number. There you go. So we can call the my instruction with this data, but then we also need to provide the accounts. So I'm gonna say accounts, and here we have the data account, which we will just, I don't know, use a new key pair. Damn it, don't you have a key pair? Oh, that's how you do it in Anchor. Okay, fine. See, it's it's all a bit different than we're used from the Web3. Ah, oh, there we have. Anchor.web3 hides the Solana Web3 stuff. Okay, so we just generate a new key pair. Set that public. Here's the data account. What else do we need in here? The user is my account. So wait, who do I sign here with? I guess I need another keeper to sign with. I mean, I could also sign as the data account, which nah, would work, but like, I'm gonna be nice and say there's another user. And then we need the system program and that we find in web three system program, program ID. Cool, so that's the accounts. Then we provide the signers. And in this case, the data, wait, actually the user and the data account keeper need to sign. However, that's not gonna work if they ain't got no sol on there. So probably for the user, I do want to create a, an actual keeper file so I can drop some sol on there. Because the next thing would be to call RPC, which basically does the send transaction. I could also just do dot instruction and get the instruction out and then manually send, but we do it like that. And then here we say anchor test, mm, skip deploy. What do you try to do when I say anchor test? Ah, that automatically starts the local test validator, deploys the program and runs the test. Can I manually, manually run those tests? TS config chases. Mm. Okay, let me stop my local test validator for a second and then run anchor test. Then it just starts one up here. There we go. And we get the error, fail to send transaction. This program may not be used for executing instructions. Okay, that's not the error I expected. Kind of looks like it hasn't been deployed. Also, it was way too fast anyway. But it it did not deploy then, did it? What can I say here? There. I'm just gonna use the one I had and I'm gonna use this flag to skip local validator. There we go. Now it's deploying there and then there we go. That's more what I expected. Okay, so I have my local test validator running here now and I use the skip local validator for it to not start up another one and then it's failing with 0x1 which should sound familiar we don't have enough Lamperts and we don't have enough Lamperts because obviously we create a new key pair here and then we try to fee pay with it which obviously doesn't work okay so let's create ourselves inside the tests you know what, I think I'm just gonna be lazy because I can't, like, it's always the same. It's always the same, but I think I'm just gonna be lazy and copy that over here. That's how you should not do it, but that's how I'm gonna do it. Put the private key directly in there because I can't be bothered to read a file. Yes, I'm lazy. It's just a test and I don't use that for anything anyway, but then I can be like Solana airdrop 10 sol to this user key pair and then he has some sol and then I can do my anchor test again of course with the skip local validator 
I could also skip deploy because it doesn't need to redeploy every time. There we go. And now this test passes. I mean, that doesn't really mean much, but like the transaction was sent because I don't have any asserts in here or expect. So yeah, but what we can then do is Solana confirm dash V this signature and we see what happened in the program log, the data account was created. Now that doesn't really say much, let's be honest, but it, if we look at the instructions, this account zero, the 81S, this account was created. We should also be able to see that in here because the system program was invoked. No, no, but it doesn't show us with which account. So if we say Solana account and then this, so check this out. Now we have the actual data of the account here. And we see that the first eight bytes, that's just random stuff. That's the hash of the account type. This here is my U64. Yeah, that's my eight bytes of the number that I put in. So if I convert that from hexadecimal to decimal, then that should give me one, two, three, no, six, six, six. The nine A zero two little endian. So two nine A two nine A hex to decimal. There we go. Is six, six, six in decimal easy. And then the remaining two bytes, they are still zero, zero. That is my number two. That's this thing because I didn't write anything in here. I could write something in there as well. So let's write, I don't know, two because it's number two. Ha, Lord. Um, and do the same thing again. This time I wanted to redeploy, build and redeploy. There we go. I'm just gonna do a new text. Oh shit, I already lost it. What was the account now? The 81. If we Solana confirm this thing, then this account was the DK something. Solana account this thing. There we see now that two is in here and the same data here. Pretty simple, huh? And just to do something ourselves now, that's now this account. Let's create a function where we sum the numbers of two accounts or something. So I would do a, an instruction like the one we had, my sum, and we don't do any input data for that. And we'll provide some accounts and the some accounts look as follows. We don't need the system program anymore. We don't need a user anymore. I mean, somebody needs to sign, but I don't need to access the account. So I will leave it out. And I will just make that account mutable. So data account one and data account two, two mutable accounts. Actually, do they need to be mutable? No, because I just wanna, I don't know, print the account. So then I don't even need that. But the point is they need to be of type account struct still. So they still need to have the number one and number two. And inside that thing, I just calculate myself the sum, which is context accounts, data one, number one, plus this from account two, number one. So I sum up the two number ones and then I say, the sum is sum. That's all the my sum does. It just calculates the sum and then prints it because can't be bothered to do something more complicated. So that's that. That's basically all we need. Then say anchor build again to update the IDL. If we now have a look in our IDL, I said if we now have a look in our in our IDL, we hopefully have yep the my sum instruction here as well, so that we can use in our test now. Just create another test test sum where we do the my sum, which doesn't take any parameters, but it needs accounts and it needs the following accounts: the data account one which I'm just gonna hard code in here. It's gonna be this one. And then the data account two is gonna be this one. All right, let's test this again. Oh, 
the sum fails. Unknown signer. Um, I mean, if I don't use this, I'm pretty sure I need some signer. Otherwise I can't pay the transaction fee. Oh, don't ask me where that transaction fee comes from. But without the signer, that seems to work. Let's look at that. We have the signature, this account, this account, that's the program. Oh, I am the fee payer. Then it automatically just uses my public key, the one that I also deployed the program with. Okay, that's fine. Good anchor, you do that, that's that's okay. Because it's inside this program here. No, inside that provider. But we will learn about that next time, so don't, don't worry too much about that. We do have a fee payer, that's all. Those are the two accounts, this one and this one. And essentially here we call the my sum and the sum is 1332 because that's 666 times two. I would have liked to be this a bit higher. Five higher. So that's the, that's the happy part, the happy path if everything works. Now just to demonstrate that I can't just put any account in here now if I were to, for instance, put in my account and try to build the sum from that, then Anchor will automatically fail that transaction there. Oh yeah, cannot read property of undefined. Okay, maybe I don't want to skip deploy. There. Anchor error caused by account, data account two, error code number 3007. The given account is owned by a different program than expected. So this account is not one of ours. And even if it was one of ours, it also needs to be of that type. I could use a different account struct in here now. This account is now created with a different account struct. So Solana account, this thing will have different data here. The rest is the same though. So that the numbers stay the same, but the discriminator is different. And if I put in that account in here, then it's owned by my program. So the owner check will pass, but then the account check will still fail because different error now, eight byte discriminator did not match what was expected. So Anchor checks that the correct accounts are put in because here I wrote it needs to be of that type. So I'm expecting this account, but I put in one that has a different one from a different type which in that example doesn't really make sense because they have the same things. But, you know, in, in reality, you will have different things. Like f think of the token program that has the mint account and the token accounts. They, they have a different layout. So it makes sense to distinguish between them. And Anchor implements all of those checks for us. We don't need to deal with that. We just say what we want and Anchor automatically does the checks. So that's super helpful. And that concludes my introduction to Anchor. I think I'm good with that. We'll have a look more at this front end stuff with the providers and whatnot next time. You can do a challenge for yourself, build something like the thing I built or what James did here, or do your own thing, a counter with an increment and a decrement. Try not to copy too much from us. Try to do it yourself or do it once with copying and then with trying it yourself. The more you do it, the easier it will be for you to write anchor programs. It's just getting used to all of those. How do you write that, write this and then this and where, is, where are all those things? It's just practice. So just write your own anchor programs. You'll get used to those things. I hope that this video was helpful and I hope that you enjoy your journey of learning Solana programming. Anchor makes writing programs a lot easier so you can write programs faster once you get a hang of it, once you know how all of this works. So yeah, we're making steps in that direction. We are now done with the intro to Anchor development. Next time we do client side and then we'll have more, more Anchor stuff coming up. So make sure to subscribe, like the video. That's the thing for subscribe. No, subs subscribe like the video and check out those other videos as well. And then I see you in the next one. Till then, bye-bye.